In the last video, we saw how to represent sequences. Now we're going to see how I actually predict with these. Maybe you have a series of stock prices, you want to predict the next one. I mean, good luck with that. I probably would not be teaching this class if, if that had actually worked out for me. But you get the idea. We're going to actually see sunspots and some other basic techniques with this. I am going to go ahead and ensure that the runtime type does have a GPU. I encourage you to do the same. I am going to run this part here so that it initializes and we're going to have actual access to the underlying accelerator, in this case a GPU. This should work just fine on Apple M1, M2 as well. And there you can see we have CUDA available. So LSTMs, we are going to talk just a little bit about the theory behind them and then get into using them. This class is an applications class, hence the name, but I do want you to see a little bit of what an LSTM is and how it actually works. We're going to deal with two types of function here. You can see the sigmoid and the hyperbolic. The, you've probably seen these before if you've worked with machine learning, but if not, these are functions. They look very similar in shape. Now, the fact that we're using hyperbolic tangent, this has nothing to do with trigonometry. We simply like the shape of it. Sigmoid, you can see they're both S-shaped, and that's what S-shaped, well, whatever, S-shaped. So this is this is basically used as a gateway sort of a function. So if the values are lower coming into it, it's going to be at zero or turned off. If the values are higher, it's going to be at one. If sigmoid has a lot of uses in the area of machine learning, but in particular here, we're going to use it like a switch. There's multiple gates in LSTMs and the input gate, the forget gate, and the, the store gate. So we're going to see all three of those together and how they interact. Then there's also the hyperbolic tangent. And the hyperbolic tangent is used. Similarly, it's S-shaped as well, but you'll notice that it ranges between negative 1 and 1 rather than 0 and 1. This allows us to use it to control additive sort of features. Like we want to add maybe negative one or one to, to something like the internal state is where we'll see that this is used. So keep those two in mind. We're going to talk, talk about them some as we, as we go through here. Okay, this diagram shows LSTM. There's three LSTMs here, but there's, there's actually not. This is over time. This is over three time units. T represents time. So T negative one to the current, T, t now time, to tomorrow or to the next, next time unit, T plus one. It's showing the interaction as the LSTM changes state over it. So the LSTM from the, the past outputs a couple of things to the LSTM1 in the future. So first of all, X, so the input, comes into the LSTM of the past, and the outputs from the LSTM, first of all, are just the, the output, the Y hat. And this is the Y hat that it, it produces. Initially, so this is just the Y hat that it produces as it outputs. But the other outputs that are very important go to the LSTM of the future. Now the LSTM of the past, the first one, had nothing. So you can think of these two inputs as essentially zero. But the one is the context or the internal state of the LSTM. The second is the, the output. This is the same output that was given up here, but it also goes to the next LSTM, which is itself just in, in the future or in the present as, as the case for T. And now some new input comes into the LSTM and the output also occurs, just like before, but the output now is not just dependent on that input. So if the stock price today is whatever, it's now just, it's now dependent on the, the context or the internal state that was remembered. We'll get more to that in a moment. That, that just changes over time as the 
it gives the, the neural network a, perhaps a way to recognize maybe a, a week's worth of stock prices, that it, it can see a trend. Whereas the other input, the why uh, from yesterday, it's, it's good to know what the weather was yesterday. It's good to know what the stock price was yesterday. But that doesn't allow it to build the continuity trend as, as much as the C does. And then for the price in the future, this just keeps continuing. The context and the previous value keep being fed into the LSTM. And the LSTM gradually learns to recognize trends as its internal gates are learning to deal with and adapt to the data. But what are these internal gates that I keep, that I keep telling you about? They are right here. And these internal gates show you how the LSTM is dealing with it. This is oriented exactly the same way as it was before. So you can see that the outputs are still the same. It, it outputs something here. It takes the input, and you can see kind of everything flows from the input because yeah, the input, that's, that's what drives everything. But the previous input and also the context are also important. And you can see how the context is created here. And it also passes just the current Y. Whatever it output here, it, it gets output to the next LSTM. So this is essentially the same thing because these are both the outputs of this multiply. So let's work backwards on a couple of these. First, let me just show you internally what's going on before we work backwards. So we've got the gates here you can see the F gate here. This is the forget gate. LSTMs get traumatized, they need to forget things. Well, no, it's, it's, it's something like that though. But certain times that context is just no longer that important and it needs to be forgotten. And you can see that the context is being multiplied by the, the output from the sigmoid going through the, this, this forget gate coefficient. And this is a learned parameter. To what degree should it forget? It's multiplied by the context, so obviously if this becomes a zero, it's going to completely forget what was going on before. Or if it's one, it's going to completely remember. Or it'll be somewhere in between. Because this output from the sigmoid that ultimately is driven by the, by the input by the parameters of it, the weights, the learned, the learned parameters, that is, that is what's going to drive, whether it needs to remember it or forget it. And buried into all of this, this that's going into it is also the context and what it's learned before. There's also the input gate. And the input gate is right here. This is quite important. This is going to determine if the input should be remembered into the context, into the trial context that it is gradually building up as it, as it goes through, which is this context hat that is being. And then finally, this output gate is determining if that remembered context, if that should go through to, to the next value. Now, there's plenty of videos that do talk about going into all of the mathematics behind this and how these are all calculated. These all boil down to a series of equations that are optimized using gradient descent, typically, as this thing learns. We're focusing more on the application, so I'm really more just concerned that you see that this context is, is being determined by the input, by the previous input, and, and moving forward. So let's look at a simple LSTM example, and I am going to actually run this one. Here you can see the features. You can see, this is a really simple example. All I'm doing is I'm trying to have it detect. I was thinking of this like a car driving by. There's a camera and the car was maybe right here. Maybe the car was here or here or here or where, wherever as, as it passes through a narrow slit that it can see. And I want it to tell me what color the car is. And the colors are one, two, three, et cetera. Zero means nothing. And here you can see, well, here it was a one. It was a one colored car. Two was two, so on and so forth. We set up the LSTM layer and we basically just put it right in with uh, the rest of it. We also put some dropout just to help combat overfitting. 
we train it, and it trains really pretty, pretty quickly. Then we can run it. Here we can see that it was detecting a one-colored car. Maybe there was a two-colored car that was that was here earlier in the sequence. So it, 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 it learns to detect that. This is a really, really simple one, but I'm just showing you how you can adjust it. I don't know, we can give it a multicolored car. That's truly evil. I didn't train it on that, but uh, it figures a three. Maybe it's maybe since the front of the car is a is a three. I, I don't well technically the back of the car would be a three because it would see the two first. So anyway, that's that's that very, very simple example. Next we're gonna look at the sunspots and we're gonna try to predict sunspots. This is a classic, classic data set that is often used to show time series. So we have a single value that gives us the number of sunspots going way back into the into 1818, so early, 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 early modern history, I guess you would say. So this bit here shows that we load the sunspot data and we put the column names. I'm using the exact same CSV that the government gives you because it, it is the US government that tracks this. And we give the columns their names because the US government doesn't give us column names. We are now going to convert these into sequences. So if you've got a whole series of, 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 time, of sunspot values, we're going to break them up into sequences of 10. So we're going to grab the first 10, then we're going to slide it one to the right. We're going to grab the next 10, slide it one to the future to the right. Another slice, slide it again, another slice. And that's basically how you how you do that. And that's what this little function is doing here. It's basically going from up to the length of the observations minus the sequence size, because obviously it, it needs to stop once the sequence size hits, hits the right end of the data that it has. And from here, we obtain the X train and Y train and also the test so that we can begin to train the neural network on this. We're going to use batching because that's a good idea. And we set the set the batch size to 32 and we're good to go. We're going to create the LSTM model. This is very similar to the simple example that we looked at earlier. And we set up the LSTM layer and and output this to a to a single neuron that is where we're trying to predict. We put a densely connected layer in the middle here just, just to allow some additional learning, and we set the dropout to 20%. We're now ready to train this, and we're making use of several things here that we've seen before. We're training it over a number of epochs, but we do have early stopping, uh, and we're, we're training it. Once this is complete, early stopping kicks in, and we're done. We're also reducing the learning rate according to to a, to a small amount. This doesn't help it a lot, but this is not a bad technique at all to use for this, this type of training. At the end, we're ready to evaluate it, and we do this evaluation. We can see that the root mean square error is it's, it's plus or minus around 14 sunspots. Not, not super good, but it shows you the, the steps that you would go through to, to do this. And it's, it's not the easiest data set. Thank you for watching this video, and uh, we'll, we'll continue to explore time series next time looking at transformers. So give this video a like if it was useful to you, and we'll uh, continue then. Please subscribe so that you don't miss anything.